Hello and welcome back to Wolf Girl Spring. In June of last year, I made a video about the MTV show Teen Wolf. It was both obscenely long, but honestly not even that long in the grand scheme of YouTube TV show breakdowns these days. But in that video, I strategically only covered Teen Wolf seasons one through three. There are six in total. I thought that because I can be a little long-winded, that it might make more sense to split my coverage up into parts. And then then life happened. First, the WGA and SAG-AFTRA went on strike, and I decided to stop making videos about struck media in solidarity, so I postponed the next Teen Wolf video until after the strikes were over. That ended up being a few months, and by the time the strikes had ended, not only had I gotten interested in other projects that ended up taking priority, but I was also having trouble getting back into the Teen Wolf groove. I don't know about you, but when I get really obsessed with something like a TV show or a film series, when that obsession peters out, it can be difficult for me to pick it back up. It's hard to reignite the fire. I found that the longer I waited to start working on the next Teen Wolf video, the less I wanted to work on it. It didn't help that the show got markedly worse at various points post season three. It's hard to find the motivation to keep watching a show that almost feels like it doesn't want you to watch it. But nevertheless, I persisted. I finally finished the last three seasons of A Show for Children, and it only took me an entire year. Did I consider just giving up? Many times. But as a true alpha, I honor my commitments. And I am never making a video in parts ever again. Luckily for me, the show actually did get a little better eventually, right at the end. Much to my surprise, I found myself enjoying the very last season of the show. This was a blessing, because it finally gave me that little bit of wolf joie de vivre that I needed to dive back into this. So here we are, baby, Wolf Girl Spring. It's time to cover the rest of Teen Wolf. Now, because of the deceptive way I've titled these two parts, you might think that there are only two, but this is in fact a three-part series. The real part two was a video in which I covered the two original Teen Wolf films that inspired the MTV series, as well as the short-lived Teen Wolf animated series that most people seem to have forgotten about. Oh, this is humiliating! <laughs> That video was way less popular than the first one, which I expected. It's pretty obvious that among young people, the MTV show has largely eclipsed the source material in popularity. No pun intended. But I think that video is really fun, so I would still recommend giving it a watch. But also, a disclaimer of sorts, I guess? There were some people who got mad at me for my first Teen Wolf video. These people were not the majority or anything, but it seemed that some were upset with how I had discussed season three. Specifically, I think a lot of people really love season 3B, and they got the impression that I was really criticizing 3B or that I hated 3B. To be clear, and I said this explicitly in that video, I did not hate season 3B. I thought it was fine. I just I personally prefer when the show is lighter and sillier, and 3B is really dark and moody and intense. The actual quality was fine, it was just not as much for me as the first two seasons. I was pretty mean to season 3A, but I stand by that. It's also worth noting that I mostly only ever watched the first two seasons of the show as a kid, and the rest of it I'm seeing for the first time, so I don't have the nostalgia goggles for some of these seasons that longtime fans of the show might have. But my intention with that video, which I feel like I made pretty clear, was not to give a straightforward review of Teen Wolf. This isn't exactly going to be a serious review. What I like to do is more like tell you about the funny parts. I had some more explicit criticisms, but most of that video is just me describing the stuff that I found funny. I even got at least one comment that was annoyed that I was hating on a show aimed at young girls, because media aimed at young girls is often unfairly maligned. And I know that I probably shouldn't even be engaging with stuff like this, but that one hit close to home for me, I guess, because I am aware of that fact. I've talked about that phenomenon on this channel before, and so I kind of take offense at being lumped in with that. 
yes, media for young girls does often get a disproportionate level of derision. However, one, does this mean we can just never voice any criticism for media aimed at young girls regardless of validity? I don't think so. Two, again, I don't think I was even being that critical. I was kind of just talking about how crazy and convoluted the story is. I wasn't talking about Teen Wolf the way people used to talk about Twilight, you know? And three, perhaps most importantly, I was one of those young girls. I said in the video that I watched Teen Wolf when I was a teenager. Am I, of all people, not allowed to be a little critical of this show? I was the demographic, the one that gets unfairly maligned. There was a point shortly after I released that first video when I thought I was going to really have to address this because I was getting all these comments from people who thought I was being really unfair to season three, people who thought I didn't understand the show or that I hadn't paid enough attention. But then I was like, wait a minute, what am I doing? I'm sitting there crafting like a YouTuber apology for what, not liking Teen Wolf enough? Be so serious. You are entitled to your Teen Wolf opinion, and I am entitled to mine. I will not apologize for not loving a season of Teen Wolf. And if that is a cancelable offense, then take me away, officer. All that being said, I do want to change my approach a little bit for this video. As much as I stand by the opinions expressed in my first video, writing and craftsmanship-wise, I honestly don't think it's my best work. I made that video largely for myself. I was really busy with my last year of college, and I was also living in a place I really didn't like, and I basically latched on to Teen Wolf as escapism. I'm really grateful that it got as many views as it did, but that video is a little amorphous. I wrote all of it pretty hastily. I would just sit down and let thousands of words pour out like stream of consciousness style, and then record the sections pretty much as soon as I had written them. As a result, it's mostly just a recap of the first three seasons of Teen Wolf, with my commentary and jokes thrown in along the way. It's mainly just me describing the plot. It also has terrible audio. Like, I know all my videos have bad audio, but that one is really bad. But mainly structurally, that's not really the kind of video I love to make. I like structure and chapters and tangents and really making it my own. So I've tried to make this installment a little tighter and a little more idiosyncratic. I'm going to give some more concise overviews of seasons four, five, and six, a review of the Teen Wolf sequel movie, and a couple tangents here and there. It will be a little less rambly, a little more balanced. So hopefully people like that, and it's not too much of a departure from the first part that it turns people off. I was originally going to include a segment about the most popular ship to come out of this show, kind of a fandom autopsy, but I ended up writing so much, it was getting so obtrusively long, that I decided to make that its own video. So that should be out in a couple weeks. For real this time. It's already written and everything. There's also going to be a bonus segment of this video exclusive to my Patreon, so if you want to hear me talk about Teen Wolf's fan contests and nepotism casting, or if you simply Simply want to help fund videos like this, subscribe to my Patreon. There's a good deal of bonus material on there now, including a little bit of cut material from my first Teen Wolf video, and a bonus lifetime recap video I made recently, so check it out. Now let's get into it. Wolf Girl Spring! Everybody give it up for Wolf Girl Spring! That's right, first order of business. I have to make a bit of a retraction. I was pretty vehemently anti-Scott in my first video. I hate Scott McCall. Scott McCall is the protagonist of our program. He's simple, sweet, and a little dumb. For the first few seasons of the show, Scott infuriated me. He seemed boring, irresponsible, thoughtless, a bad boyfriend, and I was annoyed at how, despite seeming pretty incompetent in most situations, the show insisted on giving Scott all these magical chosen one moments, like being a true alpha. A true alpha is one who rises purely on the strength of the character, by virtue 
the sheer force of will. We would constantly get these little speeches about how special Scott is, how kind and brave and good he is, but to me, it never felt particularly earned. It felt like we were being told instead of shown how great Scott is. I would get comments from people explaining that they liked Scott because he was dumb and incompetent, that that was endearing for them. And I could understand that in theory. Typically, I love a himbo character, but Scott didn't seem like a true himbo to me. And again, it bothered me that the show didn't seem interested in actually showing us any of his supposed attributes. But for some reason that I still don't fully understand, pretty much as soon as I started watching the last three seasons, I started to like Scott a lot more. Maybe it's that the show becomes a little more ensemble-driven and a little less focused on Scott as a protagonist, less of the story is motivated by Scott being the most special boy on Earth, which helps. Or maybe it's that the show starts to get worse around Scott, who largely stays the same, making him look better in comparison. Or maybe it's Scott himself, maybe it's the way he behaves or the new relationships he has. It's hard to say. But I just like this guy better. He makes more sense to me. It also might have something to do with my learning more about Tyler Posey. During the process of making both of these videos, I gained an appreciation not so much for Scott McCall, the character, but for Tyler Posey, the real human man. I remember before I even posted the first video, my friend and I decided to read up on Tyler Posey, and we learned a couple of wild things about him. This guy is the king of interviews. He will share anything. He started an OnlyFans page back in 2020, I believe. He describes this as being approached by some kind of team, maybe like an MCN type of deal, who wanted to kind of manage an OnlyFans for him. I was approached by some people that were like, hey, we're gonna do this we want you to be a part of this thing. I was like, okay. He's said that he was trying to be tasteful and artful about it, and that he was kind of disenchanted by not having that much control over the process, which is why he stopped doing OnlyFans at some point. They kept changing my password, and I was like, every time I would log on, I'm like, where I can't get on my f platform here. Here's a quote. I love being nude because you're not born wearing clothes. I want to go out the same way that I came in. I want to die naked. And since 2020 has been a little scary, I feel I could die any second now. So I want to be ready. Do you see what I mean? I'm kind of obsessed with him. I want to study his mind. He also has a music career. He's been a part of a few different bands as well as some solo stuff. The vibe of his music is like 2000s pop punk. Like if Fall Out Boy was just one guy, and that guy was the guy from Teen Wolf. Again, I'm obsessed. I love this for him. But on a more serious note, another interview we saw was this one where he discusses having had substance abuse issues from the age of 12. Tyler Posey got his start as a child actor, and that can be a really damaging thing for a lot of kids. Even if nothing too specifically explicitly bad happens to a child actor, children just aren't really meant to be working, and they're certainly not meant to have millions of eyes on them, so even in the best case scenarios, it's at the very least a lot of pressure to put on a child. He talks about having a troubled home life growing up, and it just sounds like he had a lot going on. Furthermore, during his time on Teen Wolf, his mother passed away between the release of seasons four and five. Season five is actually dedicated to her. So not only did I start to like Tyler Posey for his silly off-the-wall persona, but I also started to feel for him. It sounds like he's been through a lot in his life. Of course, I know that Tyler Posey being a sympathetic person in real life doesn't really have anything to do with the fictional character Scott McCall, but I do think maybe going into the second half of the show with a different perspective on the actor made me look at the character with a different perspective as well. So again, I can't fully explain it, but I am no longer a Scott McCall hater. Scott, I'm sorry I was so mean to you before. You didn't choose the writers of this show. The design on this shirt turned out to be way bigger than I thought it was going to be, so you can't even see on camera the punchline, which is that it says, surrounded by betas. Um, so it kind of ruins the entire thing. I, this is a failure. I shouldn't have even worn it. Teen Wolf season four is an interesting one. 
I mentioned those comments before that were mad about my take on season three, and I remember some of those people sassily commenting like, oh, if you didn't like season three, just wait until you get to season four. You think it's bad now, you're gonna hate season four. And at first, I thought I was totally gonna prove those people wrong. For the first few episodes, I was digging season four. The tone was a little lighter again, there was a lot of goofy, ridiculous stuff, which I love. Characters have have regular teenage commitments and experiences, the high school world actually feels lived in, which is more than you can say for like season 5 or even season 3 a lot of the time. This season also mercifully returns to the 12 episode format instead of the 24 episode two part season format we got in season 3. I was very excited to watch a short self-contained season again. But sadly, as the season goes on, it starts to lose the plot quite a bit. Season 4 sees the return of Kate Argent, the Season 1 villain. She appeared to die at the end of Season 1 when Peter slashed her throat with his claws, but it turns out that he did not scratch deep enough to kill her, instead accidentally turning her into a were-jaguar? There's a saying, sometimes the shape you take reflects the person you are. I think they say something tying it back to the Kanima thing, like that principle of how what you transform into can be related to who you are as a person, but like what, did Kate have jaguar energy? Was her personality particularly jaguar-like? Anyway, she was hiding out in Mexico, where she found these guys, the Berserkers. These are a little like the Oni from Season 3, just big, depersonalized warrior monsters who can be controlled by someone, in this case Kate. So you think Kate is the main villain of this season, and at first it's pretty fun. The first episode is bonkers. The gang have traveled to Mexico to find Derek, who was kidnapped by Kate at the end of the previous season. See, you can tell it's Mexico because of this yellow, yellow color grade. Jesus Christ. <laughs> When they finally find Derek, he has been de-aged by Kate. He's teenage Derek. This was so funny to me because it's like something that would happen in a fan fiction, right? It's so ridiculous. I loved it. Oof. Wow. We even get a Cousin Miguel callback. Miguel. It's by my cousin Miguel. My cousin Miguel. He eventually gets turned back. I still don't really understand how Kate was able to do this to him, but he's back. He's fine. But then things start to get more convoluted. The real villain of this season is this anonymous shadowy figure called the Benefactor, who has created a Deadpool of all the supernatural creatures in Beacon Hills. It's a Deadpool. We're all on it. That's the main conflict of the season. Someone, the benefactor, has made a list of supernaturals and given them all bounties. And of course, resident special little boy Scott McCall has the highest bounty. So throughout the season, several different people try to take advantage of this Deadpool by attempting hits on our various supernatural creatures, which basically results in there being several secondary antagonists. These two high schoolers are trying to kill supernaturals on the Deadpool. Pool. This sheriff's deputy tries to kill another sheriff's deputy who's on the Deadpool. Lou Ferrigno Jr.? Huh. There's this guy called the Mute going after people on the Deadpool, who you assume is some kind of supernatural creature himself, but is in fact just a big scary human guy with no mouth who kills people with a tomahawk. And the way Kate figures into all of this is that she received a tape from the benefactor instructing her to break into the Hale family vault, which is a thing that exists, to steal some talisman that they said would help her control her where jaguar shifting. They actually wanted her to open the vault so that they could steal $117 million worth of bearer bonds to fund their Deadpool. 117,000? It's things like these that make me want to know so much more about the Hale family. Why do they have 117 million dollars in bearer bonds? Bonds. 
bearer bonds and they took them all. Anyway, the big reveal is that the benefactor is actually Meredith, the banshee we met in season three, who was institutionalized at Eichenhaus. You remember, the spooky psychiatric hospital? Eichenhaus becomes a very funny institution in seasons four through six. When it was first introduced, I kind of got the impression that although it was a gratuitously spooky place with some corrupt orderlies, it was still, for all intents and purposes, a legitimate, non-supernatural mental health facility. But by season five or so, they have thrown any desire to be grounded in reality out the window, and it's just a straight-up supernatural prison built by a hellhound, complete with a mad scientist obsessed with drilling holes in people's heads. So Meredith is the benefactor, and her motivation for putting bounties on the heads of all the supernaturals in Beacon Hills is admittedly very funny. It turns out that years ago, before the events of season one, Meredith was in the hospital in some sort of coma, and she happened to be staying in the same room as the badly burned and also comatose Peter Hale. During this time, Meredith was was able to hear Peter's thoughts, meaning a constant stream of mad ravings about wanting to exterminate all the supernaturals in Beacon Hills in order to start over with a stronger batch of supernaturals. Again, this is just hilariously presented. But she made us weak. She made us weak. And what happens to the weakest in the heart? They get picked, picked off, off by the predators. This is how it feels to recount the plot of Teen Wolf to your friends and family. Bear bond, I'll, I'll use every penny. Penny. If I have to, I'll start with with the professionals and then maybe I'll disseminate the list further. Anyone can become a killer for the right price because when it comes down to it, everyone can be corrupted by money! But Meredith took all of this completely seriously and decided to enact this plan after Allison died. The reason I say it gets worse over the course of the season is that I think there's just way too much going on. The benefactor thing I just described is fine, I think. It's fine funny at least, and it probably would have been enough for the whole season, like the overarching benefactor whodunit supplemented by the little mini-villains who are going after hits from the Deadpool. But for some reason, they also felt the need to have all this stuff with Kate, and this whole mysterious backstory with Lydia's grandmother, who is not a character we've seen on the show, and is dead, actually, so it's all like this off-screen mystery, which is more confusing than anything. At the same time, they're also introducing all these new villains and monsters and concepts. We meet the Berserkers, the Trepanation mad scientist, we find out Wendigos exist in this universe, too. Malia, Coyote Girl Malia, is having this subplot where she learns Peter is her dad. I don't know. Derek has another romance storyline this season, this time with Brayden, who is a human bounty hunter that we met in season three. You know her? Brayden. I didn't mind this nearly as much as the Derek-Jennifer romance or anything, beyond the fact that Derek having a normal, flirty romance with anyone feels kind of out of character. I think these two have decent chemistry. I like Brayden. It's just a little boring, you know? The eternal problem with Derek is that despite having such a wild backstory and so much trauma, the show is never interested in dealing with any of it, so after season two, he's pretty much constantly relegated to being a stern but good hearted well-adjusted guy, which isn't very exciting to watch. And finally, I haven't even mentioned this yet, but a major part of this season is that Scott gets his first beta. He bites and turns someone into a werewolf for the first time. Meet Liam Dunbar, a freshman with anger issues. Back when I was living in London, watching the first three seasons of Teen Wolf, one of my roommates had watched more of the show than me, and she would always tell me that Liam was like the scrappy-doo of Teen Wolf. And I have to say, that is a pretty accurate description. Liam is like Scott's Scrappy-Doo. He's a little baby version of Scott that's supposed to get you reinvested in the show. Also, Liam is played by an actor named Dylan Sprayberry, which I think sounds like the name of the heir to a cranberry juice dynasty. My apologies to my patrons who have now heard that joke twice. The way Scott turns Liam makes me laugh a lot. Like I said, I'm no longer a passionate Scott hater, but this moment is definitely emblematic of one of the problems you often see in the writing of Scott's character. 
So this all happens because Scott is trying to save Liam from a Wendigo in the hospital. The three of them end up on the roof, and the Wendigo pushes Liam off the edge. Liam is dangling for his life. Scott, in fighting the Wendigo, has both of his arms engaged, and Liam is slipping off the edge of the roof. And Scott can't use his arms. Can you see where I'm going with this? Scott has no choice but to grab Liam's arm to save him from falling with his mouth. <laughs> Not only is this ridiculous, but in my opinion, this is bad Scott writing because it takes away his agency. The show is so committed to making him this ultra good guy who has never done anything wrong in his life ever that they don't even let him make his own morally ambiguous choices. He has to be left with absolutely no other option than to bite Liam in order to save him. A character who does the right thing 100% of the time is not that interesting of a character. If I were to script doctor this moment, I would maybe make it more like Liam is really sick or injured or something and might die, ideally because of Scott or his pack putting him in danger, and Scott has to make the decision in the moment to bite him in the hopes that he'll turn and heal. It's ambiguous because, as we know, sometimes people don't survive the bite but it would still basically be morally okay because there would be that assumption that he probably would have died anyway. I just feel like something like that would have felt a little more interesting and could have provided Scott with some drama throughout the season, like guilt or self-doubt over whether that was an okay decision for him to make. As it's written on the show, Scott doesn't really have to feel bad or uncertain about this choice at all, because it wasn't really a choice. The choice was made for him. What happened to you, what I did to you, which I had to do in order to save you? It's just really silly to me that the show keeps passing up opportunities to make Scott a more interesting character. Anyway, I bring up Liam because it's another huge storyline weighing this season down. Just the Benefactor storyline and the Liam storyline would have been plenty. You don't need Kate, you don't need the Berserkers, you don't need to go to Mexico, you don't need Baby Derek, as much as it pains me to say that, you don't need Lydia's grandma. It's similar to the problem with season 3A. Why can't they just keep it simple? I think this show is at its best when they have a simple, straightforward, character-driven central premise to a season, but they often get bogged down by too many characters and way too many boring external conflicts. Speaking of too many characters and boring external conflicts... I would say season 5 is my least favorite season of Teen Wolf. I think it is the worst one. And it's kind of hard to pin down exactly why. All the pieces are technically there. The story makes sense, the characters are relatively consistent, and yet it just doesn't connect. Season 5 is back to the two-part season format, although notably they've reduced it to 20 episodes instead of 24 like season 3. I say notably because I was not aware of this when I started the season, I just dove in without really looking through all the episodes first. So as a result, while watching it, I assumed that the season was split into two 12-episode halves, like seasons 3A and 3B, and it was only when episode 12 came and went that I realized realized that it was in fact split into two 10 episode halves. I had plowed right through the season 5A finale and started 5B without even realizing it. Yes, this is on me, but I do think it says something that the divide between 5A and 5B was so anticlimactic that I didn't even realize the finale had come and gone. That's the weird thing about season 5. In the other two-part seasons, seasons 3 and 6, the A and B halves are their own separate, contained stories. Like, there's continuity between the two halves, obviously, but they have different villains, a different central mystery, etc. Whereas season 5 is all just one big story that happens to be split into two parts. That might not sound that outrageous, but I'm annoyed by it, and it certainly means that this is the longest, most drawn-out story in the show. 
So season five begins at the precipice of the gang's senior year. They're all feeling a little uncertain of what the future holds. There's this framing device throughout the season where Lydia is catatonic in Eichenhaus in the care of Dr. Head Driller. Valak. His name is Dr. Valak, but he's the one who can't stop drilling holes in people's heads. This special device is designed for trepanation. The medical art of drilling into the human skull. He drilled a hole in his own head and now has a third eye. I don't think it's ever really fully explained, but you know, who cares? Lydia is trying to remember what happened to her, what led to her being institutionalized, so that gives us some suspense about the events of the season. In episode one, this new werewolf shows up and helps the gang fight off a bad guy. This new werewolf is Theo Rakin. This is so weird. He introduces himself, and Scott and Styles are both like, Theo? I guess I look a little different since the fourth grade. Theo? And it turns out that the three of them were all friends in the fourth grade, but then Theo moved away, and now he's back because he's looking for a good pack and had heard that Scott was the big wolf on campus. A couple months ago, I heard of an alpha at Beacon Hills. When I found out his name was Scott McCall, I just couldn't believe it. Not to be confused with the television show Big Wolf on Campus. This is so weird, right? I find it so weird that they introduce a new character by telling us our main characters actually already know him, they knew him way back when, and now he's back. It's just weird. It's like a retcon. I don't like it. It doesn't feel authentic. To me, this is one of the big problems with this season. Theo is basically our big bad, but he's boring and I don't like him. Mind you, if you're a big Theo fan, don't give up hope. I actually did end up liking Theo a lot more in season six, but for right now, he sucks and I hate him. The show acts like whether Theo is evil or not is ambiguous at first. He's pretending to be a good guy and only Styles distrusts him, but it's just so obvious from the beginning that he is evil, and once he fully reveals himself as a villain. It's not like they subvert it any further or do anything interesting with it. He's just completely evil, apparently since birth. Theo killed his sister when he was a child, or allowed his sister to die without helping her, because he wanted her heart because the Dread Doctors told him to do that. Who are the Dread Doctors, you ask? The Dread Doctors are these gas mask, mad scientist looking monsters who experiment on shapeshifters who are also genetic chimeras. I guess you're potentially a genetic chimera, meaning you have more than one genotype, if you've had an organ transplant or if you absorbed your twin in the womb or something like that. The Dread Doctors need genetic chimeras because they're trying to create shapeshifter chimeras, like combinations of different shapeshifters, and that only works if the person is already a genetic chimera. So they round up a bunch of teens who are genetic chimeras and inject them with mercury, which has something to do with the process, and then turn them into hybrids of different types of shapeshifter. It turns out Theo is one of these chimeras, a rare successful one. So he's part werewolf and part were coyote, and he's trying to usurp Scott as Alpha. I guess he just wants to be powerful and have a pack of his own. You're a chimera. I'm the first chimera. It's the coyote part, you don't notice. But all the other chimeras keep dying, and when they die, Parrish, one of the sheriff's deputies who became more of a recurring character in season four, goes into this trance-like state and carries the bodies to the Nemeton, which is the magical tree stump in Beacon Hills. You guys remember the magical druid tree stump. It turns out Parrish is a hellhound, or possessed by a hellhound, which is this insanely overpowered creature in the Teen Wolf canon that can control fire, survive fire, make magical super fire, and is practically indestructible. Then, at the midpoint of season five, Theo resurrects all the dead chimeras at the Nemeton by injecting them full of goo. You think you lost your mind? Watch this! The goo is from this tank in the Dread Doctor's lair that's been holding, I'm not kidding, a preserved werewolf Nazi from World War II that the Dread Doctors call Der Soldat. He was a Nazi. 
and an alpha werewolf. And don't ask me how or why, but injecting all the dead mercury-poisoned chimeras with the Nazi goo brings them back to life, seemingly with no real consequences. Then, in the latter half of the season, there's this new threat called the Beast of Gévaudan, which is a real, historical, maybe mythological beast that supposedly terrorized a French province in the 18th century. I find the beast really lame, mostly because it's just this CGI blob monster. Much of the CGI on this show is iffy, but they usually get away with it by using it relatively sparingly. This is one of the times they misuse it. The beast looks kind of weightless and overly smooth, and it never feels like it's actually present in the room with any of the characters. While we're on the topic of bad VFX, this season featured some of the worst green screen I have ever seen in a professional production. Anyway, this storyline results in a really goofy backstory episode set in the 18th century about an Argent ancestor who defeated the Beast, and she's played by Crystal Reed, who played Allison, so that's cool. Every single actor in this period portion of the episode is doing the worst French accent you've ever heard in your life. It was not enough of her left for a proper burial. But it never eats its victims. It kills for sport. No. I hunt animals, not rumors. <laughs> but I guess the end game of the Dread Doctors was to create a chimera strong enough to bring back the Beast of Gévaudan. The chimera in question turns out to be Mason, Liam's best friend introduced alongside him in season four, who is a genetic chimera because he absorbed his twin in the womb. I don't want to get too much into just recapping the season. Can you already sort of see why this isn't a very good one? Similarly to the last one, it's just so overstuffed with villains and new concepts and monsters and revelations. I think the big problem with the Dread Doctors, and this also applies to creatures like the Berserkers or the Ghost Riders who show up in season six, is that they're so depersonalized that they are not compelling as antagonists. These are just big, faceless, personality-less monsters. They're like robots. They technically have have a motivation to bring back the beast, but it's not a relatable human motivation, so you can't really connect to it. Theo is supposed to be our human entry point here, the part of the villain machine that we can connect to, but like I've already said, he doesn't have a lot going on. He's just evil in a totally generic, uncomplicated way. Probably my favorite season of Teen Wolf is season two. I think it's kind of where the show peaked, at least in terms of what I like about Teen Wolf. Obviously, if you like the darker tone stuff, you might prefer season 3B or something. But one thing I really love about season 2 is how straightforward and human the antagonists are. Obviously, we have Gerard, who's kind of the ultimate boss bad guy, and he's awesome. We all love Gerard, right? Mountain ass! legendary performance and just a good old-fashioned campy old guy villain. You could argue that Gerard is just evil like Theo, but Gerard has much clearer, more realistic characterization. He's like a werewolf fascist. He has spent his entire life being indoctrinated with hatred and fear for shapeshifters, and now he sows that same hatred and fear to his children and eventually to the rest of Beacon Hills in season six. He's not just some teenager with a vague hunger for power. And then you have Matt, who's motivated by this traumatic event in his past, drowning because of the negligence of the swim team. It's a lot like a slasher movie. Vera Dika identified the traumatic backstory motivating most slasher killers as the past event in her 1987 essay on what she had then dubbed the stalker film. The killer takes his bloody revenge as retribution for the trauma of the past event, regardless of whether the young people he's picking off are actually directly responsible or not. The only difference here is that instead of using a knife, machete, or drill bit, Matt's murder weapon of choice is a teenage lizard monster. What I'm trying to say is that a villain like Matt or Gerard has a very personal and understandable human connection to the characters they target and the evil deeds they do. I keep using that word, connection, connect. It was E.M. Forster who wrote in Howard's End, only connect the prose and the passion, and both will be exalted, and human love will be seen at its highest. Live in fragments no longer. In my opinion, season five of Teen Wolf is all prose and no passion. 
It lives in fragments. Like I said, all the necessary elements appear to be in place. It has a logical narrative of events, it has characters with motivations, but it's missing the connection, the human element, the secret third thing, if you will. It's boring and confusing, and I didn't like it very much. Season 6A is alright. It's not as bad as Season 5, or as overstuffed and convoluted as Season 4 or 3A, but it's also not really much to write home about. In Season 6A, the Ghost Riders come to town. The Ghost Riders were introduced as a concept in Season 5, they're part of the Wild Hunt, and the two terms are basically used interchangeably. Odin's Hunt, also known as the Wild Ride or Wild Hunt. A myth of devilish riders in the sky accompanied by black dogs. These guys are like phantom cowboys who can erase people from existence. And in the first episode of the season, they erase Styles from existence. I've barely mentioned Styles yet in this video, isn't that crazy? You might be wondering what Styles has been up to in seasons four and five, and the answer is not much, honestly. I feel like he barely has anything to do in season four, and in season five, he accidentally killed a guy and was guilty about it, and that was kind of his whole thing for most of the season. And he and Malia broke up in season five, so there's that. We kind of broke up, I guess. Yeah, we kind of broke up too. An interesting thing about this half season is that from the very first episode, it establishes that this will be a Stydia season. Stydia is the Styles and Lydia ship, which has been set up from the beginning, but was kind of dropped for most of seasons four and five. Styles started dating Malia, and Lydia seemed like she was being set up with Jordan Parrish, the sheriff's deputy. I don't think they ever made it explicit exactly, but it seemed like the writers were testing out this sort of flirtationship between them. Now, these actors are the same age in real life, because most of the actors playing teens on this show are comically too old to play teens, but in the show, Parrish is a grown man, apparently pursuing a high schooler, so I can't say I would have been a big fan had they made this more outwardly romantic. And he's just kind of boring and lame. You know, nobody likes a cop. Anyway, at the beginning of 6A, Styles has figured out that he's going to be taken by the Ghost Riders, so he tells Lydia he loves her and tries to get her to remember him in some way. I'll talk about all the relationships in a later section, so I won't dwell on the Styles and Lydia thing for now. The whole thing with the Ghost Riders is that once they erase you from existence, it's like you've never existed. No one remembers you existing. So this leads to some fun drama where we see what life is like for the Teen Wolf gang without Styles, without even the memory of Styles. Most dramatically, now that Sheriff Stalinsky doesn't have a son anymore, Styles' mom is back. Styles' dead mom, whom we've never met, is a character now. Oh, and your wife's waiting for you in your office. My wife. At first, I thought this was like a really cruel detail implying that Styles is the reason that his mom is dead, but no, it's eventually revealed that the Wild Hunt has created a fake facsimile of Styles' mom out of his dad's pain or something. You, you think I made up a phantom wife? I thought all of this was pretty fun but I do wish they'd done a little more with this concept. Like, if one of your main characters has never existed, that should open the door for all these fun, it's a wonderful life, butterfly effect kind of changes in the world, right? It would have been fun to see them come up with some weird, eerie differences in everyone's lives because of Styles' absence. Anyway, most of the season is the characters trying really hard to remember Styles. It's kind of like Tinkerbell. Like, if they just believe in him hard enough, clap hard enough, for Styles, he'll come back to life. Concentrate on Styles. Similarly to the Dread Doctors and Theo in season five, the Ghost Riders have a boring human controlling them. And in this case, it's the Nazi guy from the Tank Full of Goo. Tank Full of Goo callback. He has come back to life and is hiding out as the school science teacher, which is campy in a way that I like, so I appreciated this. But he's still pretty boring as a villain and tasteless as well, but that kind of goes without saying. And speaking of Theo, he comes back in this season. At the end of season five, he gets dragged down to hell, I think, by his dead sister. Super hell, if you will. But in season six, Liam decides that they need Theo's help, so they bring him back up.
Thus begins Theo's tentative redemption arc. He seems to be feeling remorse for letting his sister die as a child because he has this recurring dream where his sister rips out his heart over and over again. It's kind of like that guy in Greek mythology who got his liver ripped out by vultures every day. In any case, Theo, despite maintaining his outwardly aloof and dastardly affect, is becoming a good guy. See, it's okay that he killed all those people. He's getting a sad boy redemption arc. The guy who murdered his own sister when he was nine? Yeah, I was nine years old. I also believe that a guy in a red suit came down the chimney to deliver presents. Not really the same thing, but okay. No, like I said before, I actually do find him a lot more compelling when he's being grudgingly good, and I actually like the little antagonistic dynamic that develops between him and Liam. More on that later. And then on the flip side of the story, Styles, Peter, and gradually more and more people in the town are trapped in this ghostly train station because they've been erased by the ghost riders. Do you know if anyone works here? The following stops have been canceled. Like I said, this isn't the best season of the show, but it's definitely a step up from the last one, and it has some fun moments and set pieces and spooky atmosphere. I love a good ghostly train station. This may be controversial, but I thought season 6B was a bit of a return to form. I was shocked at how much I ended up enjoying 6B. It finally gives us another human conflict, like I was talking about before. The conflict of this season is great. Gerard, one of the best characters on the entire show, is back, leading what is essentially an anti-werewolf militia in the town of Beacon Hills. You know how I said Gerard is like a werewolf fascist? An anti-werewolf fascist, that is. This season really goes all in on that idea. It's very explicitly politically charged. And if there's one thing you learned today, it's this. The best way to build an army is through fear. This half season aired in 2017, and I have to wonder if it was directly inspired by the tense moment in American politics in 2016-2017. The premise of season 6B is that there's this monster called the Anukite, a literally faceless creature this time, that both generates and feeds on fear. So its presence in the town is exacerbating everyone's biggest fears, and Gerard decides to capitalize on that by turning the human townspeople People against the supernaturals. There's all this emphasis on how hatred is born out of fear, how the townspeople are only choosing violence because they're afraid of things they don't understand, things that seem foreign to them. Is it heavy-handed at times? Sure. For example, they can't resist calling Gerard's plan a werewolf genocide. As far as I can tell, he... If there's one thing you can count on with Teen Wolf, it's tastelessly exploiting real-world tragic events for the sake of campy werewolf drama. But generally, I think this kind of rocks. It's so much better than the villains in the last few seasons. Yes, the characters are being influenced by the Anukite, but you get the sense that it's just amplifying feelings they already had, so everything still feels grounded and human and relatable. And it also feels like a fitting culmination to this story. The characters have been hiding their supernatural powers for years. It seems inevitable that one day their secret would get out, and this season after asks that question of what would happen if it did. Again, it generates so much fun human drama. The kids at school are like werewolf hazing everybody. They're cutting everyone on the hand to check if they heal or not. It's kind of Crucible-esque. What's the Crucible an allegory for again? Why don't you start by telling them that it's an allegory for McCarthyism? Oh, that's right. Thank you, Derek. It wasn't all perfect. I've already told you what my favorite season of the show is, and it isn't this one, but there were enough bright spots to make 6B perfectly enjoyable to me. I can see some people not loving this season because fan favorite Styles is largely absent from it. I'm pretty sure Dylan O'Brien was busy filming some other projects at the time, and I think this was also right around the time he was seriously injured on the set of the third Maze Runner movie, so he might have been still recuperating from that. 
And yeah, I probably wouldn't have wanted multiple seasons without Styles, but I think the season is good enough in other ways to hold up without him. And I also think the sparing uses of him there are are really effective. He has this cameo at the end of the first episode of 6B, where he's in an FBI training program and he finds out that the FBI is hunting down Derek. Chasing down a bizarrely feral unsub in the wilderness of North Carolina. <laughs> And I don't know what to tell you. Partly, I was excited to see even just this reused footage of Derek because my baby girl had been absent from all of seasons 5 and 6A. I missed him. But also, I think a spit take is honestly one of those jokes that is almost unfailingly funny to me. And this was admittedly a brilliantly executed spit take on O'Brien's part. And then Styles and Derek also return for the finale alongside Jackson and Ethan, who came back a couple episodes prior. And like the rest of this half season, I thought the finale was good. There's a Mountain Ash callback. Mountain Ash. Mountain Ash. A Nagitsune callback. A co captains callback. Co captains. You want to be co captains now. Excuse me. Co-captain. Scott McCall claws his own eyes out. <laughs> Don't worry, they grow back with the power of love. I'm glad they brought back so much of the original cast. It makes it feel like a satisfying conclusion. It leaves you with the sense that these characters will be together forever. Sure would be a shame if any other piece of media in the Teen Wolf franchise were to mess with this nice ending. Let's talk about the relationships. I'm gonna go about this mostly in chronological order. Also, this is gonna be mostly canon relationships with like one non-canon ship thrown in that I thought was worth talking about. Sorry if I don't talk about your favorite non-canon ship, but let's be real, there are too many of them to keep track of. Scott and Kira. So Scott and Kira were being set up back in season 3B, but season 4 is when they really go for it. You know what? I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. I actually like these two together. I didn't mention this earlier in my Scott apology, but I do wonder if maybe part of my reappraisal of Scott is because I like him in this relationship with Kira a lot better than I liked him in his relationship with Allison. I liked Allison, but I didn't always like the way Scott behaved while dating her. I also really like Kira, and I think it's a testament to Arden Cho, because with the wrong actor, it probably could have been really easy to make this character annoying. Kira's whole thing is that she's awkward and clumsy and quirky, and that can get on my nerves easily when done wrong, but Arden Cho has this great, understated, subtle approach to it. I think she's great. I don't actually have that much to say about the Scott and Kira relationship beyond the fact that I like it, but while we're at it, we might as well talk about what happens to Kira in the last three seasons of the show. Kira, and especially her actress Arden Cho, were done very dirty by Teen Wolf, in my opinion. In season 5, Kira's kitsune powers start getting out of control, I think because of something the Dread Doctors did. So she has to go to New Mexico to find the Skinwalkers in the hopes that they'll be able to teach her how to harness her power. This is all well and good at first. You think Kira's finally getting her own big storyline, which would be fun, and there's this nice episode, kind of a bright spot in the sludge that is season five, where Scott and Styles decide to spring Kira from the Skinwalkers, get her back, and Scott and Kira's reunion is actually pretty cute, in my opinion. But it's season five, so instead of letting us sit in that moment for even a little bit, we just immediately get back into the nonstop plot nonsense. We know what Theo's doing. He's looking for an alpha. Blind alpha. But then at the end of season five, Kira decides to go back to the Skinwalkers because she still hasn't mastered controlling her Kitsune powers. So she just leaves, never to be seen again. Fun fact, Arden Cho is something of a fellow content creator here on YouTube. It looks like she hasn't posted in a while, but she has uploaded a lot of music stuff. She makes her own music as well as covering a lot of songs. And sometimes she makes other videos like little vlogs. In 2016, 
2016, she posted this short vlog explaining that she would not be returning for season six of Teen Wolf. And while she was very cordial, she also made it sound like this was not her decision. Unfortunately, it looks like we are wrapped up with Kira's storyline and she won't be coming back for season six. But yeah, sorry that there were some interviews where I said I was excited for season six because I think at the time we were assuming that we were back. And I, yeah, you know, I think sometimes in a show where there's so many characters, there isn't always room for everyone and everyone's storylines and so I guess that was it. And I just think that stinks. I don't know why, with all these actors departing the show, you would intentionally drop one of your good main cast members. Did audiences not like Kira? I haven't been engaging much with the fandom while making these videos, but I never got the impression that people were anti-Kira. All the top comments on this vlog are very pro-Kira, upset that she's leaving the show. Also, I do think it's unfortunate that they got rid of one of their only main cast members of color, one of their strongest female characters, when meanwhile, for the last three seasons, so many of the new characters they introduce are the exact same variety of white man. There's nothing wrong with being a white man, but like, what is going on here? These three specifically, come on, they could be triplets. Anyway. I don't like that they got rid of Kira, and I think she was Scott's best relationship. The one that got away. Styles and Malia, and Scott and Malia. I'm doing these two together because I want to use it as an opportunity to talk about Malia herself, and also both of these relationships are relatively short-lived. So the first relationship begins when Styles and Malia lose their virginities to each other in the creepy torture basement of the spooky Beacon Hills Mental Hospital. Every girl's dream! And then, come season four, they're in a relationship. The whole thing at first is that Malia, being a recently feral coyote girl, does not care about anyone other than Styles. Like, she doesn't really care about the rest of the friend group. Is that what you would do as a coyote? Leave her for dead? If she was weak and injured, yeah. If hunting had been bad that season, I would eat her. And in a way, I think this makes sense as a short-lived first relationship for Malia. In her very animalistic way, it's like she sort of imprinted on him because he was the first human her age to take much of an interest in her, and they were both in this very vulnerable place, but then in the long run they realize they're just not actually that compatible. That being said, I would have appreciated this a lot more as a storyline had the show acknowledged that dimension of their relationship, if they'd maybe had the characters have a conversation about it, but instead, as it plays out, the writers honestly seem totally oblivious to it. It seems like they kind of just tried this out and then very quickly had no idea where to take it. Styles and Malia just slowly drift apart and then quietly break up sometime in season five. I say quietly because I honestly forgot they had even made it explicit that they'd broken up. I thought the characters had just gradually stopped talking to each other and we were supposed to assume that they broke up. But no, there is like one line acknowledging it. We kind of broke up, I guess. So then Styles is free to get with Lydia in season six and Malia is free to get with Scott. Yeah, I can see some people hearing my review of season 6B and being like, sure, those things are all right, but what about Scott and Malia? Did you not hate Scott and Malia? Again, I haven't really done a fandom analysis on this, but I don't believe the Scott and Malia relationship is very popular. To answer that imaginary question, yeah, I didn't love this relationship, but it also wasn't a significant enough part of the season to ruin it for me. Maybe if Scott was my favorite character on the show and I was really invested in who he dates, I would have been more troubled by it, but who Scott dates doesn't really make or break the show for me. Obviously, I preferred him with Kira, but she is gone at this point, so what can you do? Did it feel a little unnatural? Yes, and that brings me to Malia the character. As I've already touched on, Malia is this character who's still adjusting to being human. She lived as a coyote for eight years and only turned back into a human in season 3B. So right off the bat, my main issue with both of her relationships on the show is that I just don't quite buy that Malia would be interested in dating anyone at this point. Again, the Styles relationship is more defensible because you can put it down to this naive, instinctual thing. Like, in a way, it makes sense that she might kind of run into the arms of the first person she connects with as a human. But I always thought the best outcome for Malia would be realizing she's not ready to date. 
maybe breaking up with Styles and being on her own for a while to figure out who she is, what human life is. So I can buy the Styles relationship, but I can't really buy Malia suddenly realizing that she both cares for Scott and wants a relationship with him in a very normal, well-adjusted, teen TV show kind of way. That felt out of character to me. There are a lot of things I don't buy about Malia's character on this show. I don't buy that she would be so impeccably styled every day. She always has her hair in this perfect salon blowout. I don't buy that she would be as competent as she is in most human situations. I don't buy that she would be so in touch with her sexuality in such a self-aware way. Like there's this awful moment at the beginning of season four where the gang is in Mexico and Kira and Malia are at this club and Kira's feeling awkward. So Malia's like, I know what we can do to blend in and starts sexily dancing with her. Dance with me, dumbass. <laughs> with full awareness that this will make them blend in and look hot. It's very gratuitously shot. This show has been accused of queer baiting many times, mainly for other reasons, and those reasons are debatable. More on that at a later date. But this is actually textbook queer baiting. This is just shameless. Just having these two female characters do this, not because they're planning to give them feelings for each other or have them explore their sexualities, but exclusively because they thought it would be hot and maybe generate buzz. It's exploitative and sexist and homophobic, and I hate it. But also, why would Malia know that this would work? You know, why would feral coyote girl Malia be aware of the optics of grinding on Kira in a nightclub? I like Malia when she's in character as a fish out of water. I think those moments are fun. But it's like the show can't stop leering at this actress for long enough to keep Malia's characterization consistent. Liam and Hayden. So in season five, Scrappy-Doo himself gets a girlfriend. Her name is Hayden. She and Liam have a history where in the sixth grade, Hayden tried to break up a fight Liam was in and he accidentally punched her in the face. Hayden sort of accidentally walked into it and this is her yearbook photo. Apparently Hayden punched him back, and it's supposed to be a cute, silly story, but I feel like I personally would not have written a cute enemies to lovers backstory that involved Liam punching a girl in the face. It wasn't your fault. I punched you in the face. Anyway, other than that, I don't really have anything against this relationship. It's just extremely boring to me. The characters aren't always terribly boring by themselves, but together they somehow become extremely generic and bland. Hayden leaves at the beginning of 6B, and I feel bad because I don't have anything against Hayden or this actress, but I am kind of glad she left because I think Liam is more interesting when he's not with her. But to be fair, Hayden is also more interesting by herself. There was actually this thing in 6A where she's trying to help a fellow student, played by Jessica from 13 Reasons Why, and honest to God, these two had way more chemistry than Hayden and Liam. You don't have to follow me around everywhere. I'm just trying to keep you safe. And yet there are barely any fan fictions about them. Come on, Teen Wolf fandom. However, one funny thing about Hayden is that she works at a gay bar in town. Welcome to cinema. The gay bar is called Cinema, with an S, and first of all, how many subversive, high-concept gay bars can there possibly be in this one small town in Northern California? The concept of cinema appears to be that it's largely a regular gay club, except that there are random old movies being silently projected onto one of the walls. It's like a Stefan bit from SNL. This gay bar has everything. The 1925 Lon Chaney Phantom of the Opera being projected on one of the walls, an underage cocktail waitress, a scorpion boy dying in the corner. But anyway, Hayden is like 15 and has a job as a cocktail waitress at a gay bar. It's not like they're gonna do anything. They're all on the table too young to be selling alcohol anyway. To be fair, they do establish that she does this under the table. But I have to wonder, is this really the only place she could find a job? 
Are there no movie theaters or ice cream shops or fast food restaurants hiring in this town? Surely that would have been easier than getting an illegal, under-the-table job at the local classic cinema-themed gay bar. Mason and Corey. I haven't talked much about Mason yet, other than him secretly being the Beast of Gévaudan, but Mason is Liam's best friend. He's usually a more light-hearted character. If Liam is Scott's Scrappy-Doo, Mason is kind of like Styles' Scrappy-Doo. He's the smart, silly sidekick to Liam's werewolf straight man. I like Mason. I think he brings a welcome energy to the later seasons of the show. I think this actor is really great. Mason is also gay, and in season five, he hits it off with Cory, who is one of the chimeras created by the Dread Doctors. What kind of creature is Cory? Well, that's a good question. Um, his main power is that he can turn invisible. Cory, wait! Cory, wait! I love this show. They'll just pull out stuff like this as if it makes sense to exist in the Teen Wolf universe. I would have never thought to make invisibility a canon power in Teen Wolf. The wiki also says he's like a chameleon, but I don't think the show ever confirms that he's like a were chameleon, and I don't think we ever see him wolf out. It kind of just seems like he's mostly a regular guy who can also turn invisible. Again, love it. So funny. So Mason and Corey end up in a relationship. I don't have that much to say about this one either. Similarly to Liam and Hayden, it's rather generic, but I don't think it's as actively boring as that relationship. There's this thing in season 6A where it's established that although Corey can turn invisible and be imperceptible to most people, Mason can actually always sort of see him anyway somehow. It's my only power, finding you. And I don't know, that's the kind of supernatural romance that works on me. I thought it was sweet. However, there's this bizarre moment at the end of 6A where Corey is one of the people who have been whisked away to the ghostly train station, and Mason and Hayden are trying to find him, and they end up finding him horrifically hooked up to all these wires powering the two worlds merging or something. Attention all passengers, the train will be arriving in eight minutes. I just wanted to mention this because it was so shocking and out of place. The last couple seasons do contain more body horror in general, but this felt like another level. This is like Cronenberg-esque. <laughs> they are able to save Corey in the end, but if I were Mason, I would be so traumatized. For life. Styles and Lydia. Here we are, the iconic Stydia ship. This is one of the show's most popular ships, from what I understand. I thought the setup of this in season one was really sweet. I like this scene at the school dance a lot, where it's revealed that Styles is the only character who understands that Lydia's actually smart and has been faking being dumb to stay popular. And that once you're done pretending being a nitwit, you'll eventually go off and write some insane mathematical theorem that wins you the Nobel Prize. I wouldn't say I necessarily actively ship Stydia. I mean, there aren't a lot of couples I actively ship on this show. Maybe if I'd watched the whole thing when I was younger. But I do like Styles and Lydia together. I think it's probably the only outcome that would have made sense for these two characters. The only thing I would say is that I do wish they had set this up better. I know I just said I liked the setup. I do. But that was all the way back in season one. There's some stuff in seasons two and three as well, but after that, the show kind of puts the Styles and Lydia thing on hold for a while until season six. I guess there are some Stydia moments in season five, but that was kind of muddled for me by Styles and Malia's confusing breakup. While watching these moments, I wasn't 100% sure if Styles and Malia were still together or not, and that made them harder to enjoy. I'm totally okay with letting the characters explore other relationships before being endgame with each other, but I guess I just wish they'd continued the thread a little bit better in those in-between seasons. Just something to make it seem like this outcome in season six was actually planned and well thought out. Because the way there's so little Stydia in seasons four and five, and then such a major intense romantic setup for them in season six, it just feels a little manufactured. It feels, dare I say, a little fan servicey. I didn't say it back. You don't have to. 
I'm not even necessarily anti-fan service. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, whether fan service is an inherently bad thing, and I don't actually think it is, but I guess I'm using that term in this case to mean that it feels less like this was a natural development, and more like the writers realized they were running out of time to give these characters resolutions and decided to speed run the Styles and Lydia romance, perhaps partially to sate fans, and I think the characters and the ship deserved better than that. So that's my Stidia hot take. Don't get mad at me, please. Jackson and Ethan. This is a surprising one. This is a canon relationship. Towards the end of season 6b, there's suddenly this episode called Werewolves of London, which you might think is a reference to an American werewolf in London, but is actually more likely a reference to the 1935 film Werewolf of London, which is one of two films that form the basis of the tongue-in-cheek portmanteau of the American Werewolf in London title. That's right, I've lived long enough to see myself become a werewolf movie snob. Don't even talk to me until you can name five plot points from Bad Moon, Eric Red's underrated 90s werewolf movie presented mostly from the POV of a German shepherd. Anyway, in this episode, it's revealed that Jackson, Mr. Canima himself, who moved to London between seasons two and three, is still in London and is in a relationship with Ethan, the gay twin. I can't believe you actually thought I forgot our anniversary. Jackson's gay, you ask? Well, he is now, or bi, maybe, but they make it seem like he's definitively gay. I think this is funny, because it retroactively means that the climax of season two, where Jackson is saved by his love for Lydia, is now a celebration of the power of compulsory heterosexuality. There's kind of no explanation for how he got to this point, or how he met Ethan, or how Ethan ended up in London. I can only assume the decision to give Jackson a boyfriend was informed by Jackson's actor Colton Haynes having come out after he left Teen Wolf. Good for Jackson? I guess. This feels random, but I don't really have any problem with it. It's not like I was ever that invested in the other relationships of these two characters. It does make me feel a little bad for poor Danny, who was just black holed off of the show, never to be seen again, and now his ex-boyfriend and ex-best friend have linked up. I hope Danny's doing okay. There's also this annoying moment when Styles and Lydia meet back up with Jackson and realize he's gay, and they have Lydia say this. I thought you'd never figure it out. <laughs> this is a very 2012 Tumblr type of joke. It feels dated even for 2017. It just makes me cringe. That's all I have to say about it. Chris Argent and Melissa McCall. Yes, in season six, the show suddenly decides to give Argent and Melissa, two of our parent characters, love interests. And those love interests are each other. This might be controversial. I'm not sure how fans feel about this relationship, but I didn't completely hate this. I think these two actually have decent chemistry. My main gripe, though, is that this wasn't set up at all in any previous seasons. I could have been down with this if they had planted some seeds throughout the course of the show, but it's all a very sudden change starting in season six. Before this, there were actually moments here and there where I thought the show was going to set up Melissa with Styles' dad, Sheriff Stolinski. Or someone like me that's willing to bend the rules for a handsome face. But of course that never happened, probably for the best. I guess another reason you could be anti-Chris and Melissa is that they're the parents of Allison and Scott, who were in love, so if you ship Allison and Scott, it might be weird for their parents to get together. Kind of makes them like honorary step-siblings. A bit of a Claire and Jake from Degrassi moment. But either way, I feel like it's just best not to dwell on that. Liam and Theo. That's right, I'm moving on to our first non-canon ship. This is the only non-canon ship I'm talking about in this section. Like I said at the beginning, I am going to talk about one more, but that one is such a significant cultural phenomenon that I decided it needed its own video to fully unpack. You guys already know what I'm talking about. I don't know why I'm being coy about it. Anyway, first I want to talk about Liam and Theo. Now, one thing I do on my Patreon is post these blog-style updates of what I'm working on. So for the past few months, I've been sharing my Teen Wolf woes with my patrons. And a while ago, someone on my Patreon mentioned Theum to me, the Theo and Liam ship, 
explaining that they had been a fan of the ship back in the day, and that there was a significant niche of people who were really into Theum. At the time, I was partway through season five, and I honestly found this idea kind of ridiculous. I was like, Theo and Liam? Those two barely interact, and they're both boring. Why would anyone ship that? But viewer, I'm afraid that, like my initial hatred of one Scott McCall, I have had a bit of a change of heart. I hate to say it. I really do. I like to think that I'm no longer 2010's Tumblr-brained, that I'm not swayed by the promise of a ship for two random hot guys who happen to look in each other's directions a few times. And yet, listen, it seems ridiculous, but then you get to season six and suddenly you're not laughing anymore. What are you doing? Some of you might be thinking, how could you like Theo or ship him with a good guy like Liam when he's such a terrible person who has killed people and stuff? That's the main argument against the ship that I came across when I looked into it. And I hear you. That is fair. But I think at this point, because this show is so ridiculous, because it makes so little sense and things are so frequently devoid of realistic consequences, it kind of feels like anything is fair game, and any good or bad deeds on this show are kind of cartoonish and malleable. Like, Peter keeps getting second chances, despite, you know, being Peter, but Theo is off limits? Come on. Yeah, he's killed people, but this is a fictional show for babies. He was the best this guy around. What about the people he murdered? What so murder? Weird. Anyway, as I've already explained, Theo gets this little redemption arc in season six. Liam brings him back from the dead, and although he and Theo have a very antagonistic, distrustful relationship at first, and that dynamic kind of persists, even when Theo does show himself to be a little more trustworthy, they also seem to start caring about each other, especially on Theo's end. I'm on your side as long as it helps me. Trust me. I know. What are you doing? Being a bait. No! Theo acts like he doesn't care, he acts like he's still an amoral bad guy, but it's like he has some inexplicable need to protect Liam. He keeps throwing himself in front of threats to save Liam. You're kidding, right? I would do all this to keep you from being taken! On Liam's side, everybody keeps telling him bringing Theo back was a terrible idea, but Liam just keeps insisting that it was the right thing to do, that he just needed to bring Theo back. This might be a mistake. But you don't know that yet. Then, at the beginning of 6B, we get like a sad boy montage showing that Theo has been living in his car and keeps getting harassed by cops, which is very blatant, easy emotional manipulation on the show's part, but I'd be lying if I said it didn't work on me. It did make me like him more. And throughout 6B, his uneasy partnership with Liam continues. They're always kind of bickering with each other, but then Theo keeps looking at him like that and getting him to open up about his emotions. It's like, what are we doing here? To be clear, I find both of these characters pretty boring by themselves, but for some reason their dynamic together is a lot more compelling to me. So maybe they just had good chemistry, I don't know. My patron also mentioned this rumor they had heard that there had supposedly been plans to have Theo and Liam kiss in this elevator scene they have in the series finale. To be fair, this scene is... there is some tension there, I would say. I'm not dying for you. I'm not dying for you either. But I will fight with you. But I did look into this claim, and from what I can tell, it's just a rumor. I couldn't find an actual legitimate source for it. I found this Reddit post where people were discussing this, and one person says it may have come from an Instagram Live where Jeff Davis supposedly mentioned that scene feeling like they should kiss, but even if that's true, it would have just been him making an observation about the episode after it was already produced and released, not something scripted that didn't make it into the episode. But also, I was not able to find that Instagram Live, so it might not even exist. I just wanted to exhaust all of the Theum curiosity. But yeah, I don't know what to tell you. The Theum train, the spooky, ghostly Theum train, hit me. I wasn't expecting that. Please don't be mad at me.
Okay, I've been trying to be more concise and organized in this video, but the fact is that I have some Teen Wolf opinions that just don't fit into any of my established sections, and also aren't big enough for their own sections, so I might as well just air them all here. And I know what you're thinking, Jane, that's not even a wolf shirt, that's just a hoodie with a picture of a sloth on it. Well, allow me to explain. One of the wolf shirts that I ordered for this video, the Even Wolf Girls Get the Blues one, I like designed that myself. Designed. I put some clip art together, but it was my idea so I needed to make it myself, so I used one of those like custom merch printing websites. And the shirt arrived just fine, but then a few days later I randomly got this other package in the mail from them, and it contained this extra large hoodie with a picture of a sloth on it. Um, I did not order this. I don't know why they sent me this. It's probably not something I would wear in public. It says, nope, not today on it. It's very like millennial core when you just can't even adult. Nope, not today. But it kind of feels like fate, right? Like somebody wanted me to both have this hoodie and wear it in this video, potentially, so I feel like I have to, at least for a little bit. Anyway, miscellaneous thing number one. You remember that Scott's absent father came back in season three and committed to trying to be involved in Scott's life again. In season four, he is doing that, trying to be more present. We were supposed to have dinner. We had a deal. And when your mom has a night shift, we, we have dinner. You also might remember that I hate Scott's dad. I just hate his vibe, I hate how much of a cop he is, I hate that his tragic backstory is that he pushed his own child down the stairs. We watched you tumble down those stairs. And in season four, he has this very infuriating moment that only cements my opinion of him. For context, throughout this season, Scott's mom, Melissa, is short on money. She makes it clear that she's struggling to pay the bills and whatnot as a single parent. She's a nurse, by the way. And at one point in this episode, McCall is like, Scott, I promised your mom I would be around more so that she can take extra shifts at the hospital. But I promised your mom I'd be around so she could pick up some double shifts at the hospital. And it's like, oh, you're helping her take more shifts so that she can make more money if only you were also an adult with a job who is a parent to this child and could maybe, I don't know, chip in every once in a while? Like, this is insane, right? Scott's dad is an FBI agent. From what I can tell, just from a cursory Google search, federal agents in California, especially someone like Scott's dad, who appears to be kind of higher up, could easily be making like six figures. Gee, Agent McCall, if it's not too much trouble, do you think you could possibly spare a little bit of your annual hundred thousand dollars to help support your son and the mother of your child? Is that too much to ask? Melissa and Scott are apparently struggling to keep the lights on, and meanwhile Scott's dad is just around. He's like, hey, we should try to have dinner sometime. Yeah, why don't you set up a college fund for your kid, huh? How about that? I hate him. Speaking of hating Scott's dad, there's also this moment later in season four where a minor bad guy is about to kill Styles. He's standing right in front of Styles, and Scott's dad swoops in to save the day, shooting the guy point blank in the head as he stands directly in front of Styles, like a foot away. I don't know much about guns, but is this not incredibly dangerous? Is there not a huge risk of that bullet? Also shooting Styles in the head? This does not feel right. Number two, early on in season four, a sheriff's deputy pulls up a side profile mugshot of Derek, meaning that I was correct in my first video, there was absolutely no reason on earth that they needed to be using a police sketch of Derek on his wanted posters. Insane. Speaking of Derek, in season four, we find out that Derek does not own a TV. Where's the TV? And in season six, we find out that he does not own a phone. That's the Derek I know and love. You could have called. You don't have a phone. I should probably get one. Number three, the puppeteer for this show is a man named Eric Porn. 
That's just a little detail that makes me laugh whenever I watch the credits. Number four, in season four, we find out that the population of Beacon Hills is just under 30,000. Population of Beacon Hills is just under 30,000. That's obviously not a big city level population, but does anyone else feel like they were misled as to the scale of the town of Beacon Hills? This kind of ruins the small town ambiance for me. I thought we were talking a population of more like like five to 10,000. I mentioned in my first video that the small town ambiance was already compromised starting in season three with the introduction of all these huge warehousey industrial locations, not to mention the upgrade to a huge school set instead of the previous smaller one. And this just seals the deal. Speaking of which, number five, some things that bother me about the world building of Beacon Hills. Nobody on this show has pets or siblings think about it. Scott and Deaton work at a vet's office, and yet none of the central characters have a cat or a dog. It kind of makes sense not to include cats, because they establish in the pilot episode that cats react badly to werewolves. Hey kitties! Hi. But why no dogs? Dogs seemingly love werewolves. It's weird that nobody has one. I think Lydia maybe has a dog in season two, but then we never see it again after that. They could have given Styles an iguana or something. Bearded dragon, he seems like he would be a lizard kid. Then, of course, everyone is an only child. They introduce siblings sometimes with minor characters, if it's like their defining thing, like the werewolf twins or Brett and Lori, who are two werewolf siblings in Satomi's pack. But none of our protagonists have siblings. I think that's weird. Most people I know have siblings. Only children are typically the outliers. The other thing that bothers me about the world of this show is that the kids don't really have any hangout locations. Something that I think is always fun in teen shows, even bad ones, is having the little gathering places like the local diner, the cafe, the movie theater. The show Big Wolf on Campus had this teen nightclub where the kids would hang out all the time. It's really unique. Early on in Teen Wolf, we would sometimes get fun locations like the bowling alley, the ice skating rink, even though these were just one-off locations. But later on in the show, stuff like that pretty much goes extinct. Now everyone spends all their time either at school, at home, in Derek's loft apartment, or in new boring warehousey sets like the Dread Doctor's lair, the underground tunnels of the Argent bunker, etc. Hangout locations can help a teen show feel grounded in reality, in its high school setting. It's kind of part of the fantasy when you're a kid watching the show. I used to watch teen shows and think, I can't wait until I'm a teenager so I can hang out at the mall. And then of course, by the time I was a teenager, mall culture was completely dead. But you know, would it have been too much to ask for this show to have a cute little diner, an arcade, a drive-in movie theater? Even the Teen Wolf cartoon had a wolf themed burger restaurant. I could be wrong, but thinking back on the show, I'm not sure we ever see anyone go to a restaurant on Teen Wolf. Isn't that kind of weird? No one ever goes on a date or talks about the mystery of the week over lunch. I think that's weird. Scott and Kira decide to have a date in season four, and instead of picking a restaurant, the venue for their date is Derek's apartment? I guess he cleared out to let them have their date? Why would he agree to that? It doesn't look like Derek's home. He's not. Ultimately, I just think the show sacrifices some of its sense of fun and youth by not including these little teen hangout locations. Number six, in one episode of season five, we see a lacrosse poster in the background of one of the high school scenes that just says, raise your sticks. Even the sports catchphrases on this show are incorrigibly homoerotic. I can't believe we're supposed to play a lacrosse game tomorrow. Yeah. I actually forgot until I saw the banner. Number seven, product placement. You might remember that in my first video, I kept joking about the clunky product placement on the show from brands like Macy's and Icebreakers and Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. I did want to continue this thread in this video, but the last three seasons of the show do not contain as much blatant product placement that I noticed. It definitely is still there, mostly stuff like cars and smartphones, but we don't get as many of those really 
ham-fisted moments where the product is actually written into the scene. She's perfect for you. And perfect combinations are rare in an imperfect world. Which is technically an improvement in terms of quality, but feels like a downgrade in terms of my personal enjoyment. However, I did come across a few more of those silly lines on the wiki plot summaries where the contributors note the exact product being advertised. Lydia explains about the body at the gas station and sends Scott pictures of the murder scene with her new Samsung Galaxy K Zoom phone. He attaches his Samsung Gear watch to the rearview mirror in his Jeep. Derek spies the cars under the tarps and goes to check them out. He removes the sheet from one of them and reveals what appears to be a 2018 Chevy Camaro. Number eight, not one, but two actors from 13 Reasons Why show up in season six. We've got Jessica and Zach, so that was fun for me. Definitely helped keep me engaged. They both get absolutely obliterated in the same episode. <laughs> It's almost like a harbinger of the terrible fate that awaited these two actors in the following year. Sorry if I'm taller in this section. I've been experimenting with ways to make my novelty shirts that I spent money on show up better on camera. No, this isn't going to be a segment where I talk about Teen Wolf the movie and the TV show Arrested Development. Sorry to disappoint. I'm referring to the actual concept of Arrested Development. Yeah, that's that's a cultural problem is what it is. You know, you, you, your average American male is in a perpetual state of adolescence, you know, Arrested Development. Hey, that's the name of the show. In 2023, a standalone Teen Wolf sequel movie was released straight to Paramount Plus, or as I like to call it, the streaming service for which piracy was invented. This movie was actually what prompted my rewatch of Teen Wolf in the first place. I was seeing a lot of fan reactions to it, not positive reactions, and I was curious, so I thought maybe I should try to finally make it through the entire show so that I could watch this movie for myself. And now here I am, like a year and a half later, finally having watched it, the culmination to my journey. And it sucked so much. I hated it. How did this come into existence? From what I understand, some Teen Wolf cast members had really been campaigning for some sort of continuation of Teen Wolf for some time. This is already confusing to me because typically when a TV show gets a movie sequel, it's for one of two reasons. One, the show is just so incredibly popular that it makes sense to continue to ride the wave of commercial success. Think of films like the Sex and the City movies, the X-Files movies, Hannah Montana the movie, or two, the show was cancelled too soon, before it could really conclude its story or explore all of its potential, and therefore fan or creator demand leads to some sort of feature continuation. Serenity, Veronica Mars, even something like Star Trek the motion picture. So it's a little odd to me that they would choose to do something like this with Teen Wolf, a show that was moderately popular but arguably not a hugely mainstream cultural phenomenon phenomenon, and that lasted a healthy six seasons and ended on a very conclusive note. I think this lack of necessity for a Teen Wolf continuation is the film's first mistake. It means that this was an inherently redundant exercise. This story is over. Anything else is zombification. It's injecting a bunch of dead Chimera teenagers with goop until they get up and start walking again. Jeff Davis and his goons started developing the script in September of 2021, and the film released in January of 2023, so it sounds like this all came together very fast. In fact, there's this interesting quote from Dylan O'Brien, who did not reprise his role as Styles in the film. He mentioned in an interview with Variety, it was something I was trying to make work, but it all happened very fast. We didn't really know that it was happening, and they kind of just threw it at us a little bit. He's not the only actor who seemingly would have been willing to return, but wasn't able to because of scheduling. Cody Christian, who played Theo, said something similar. I just don't really understand why it was so important to get this done so fast. It sounds like if they had taken a little more time, they potentially could have gotten more original cast members involved. And also, you know, if you take your time on something, it may turn out better 
In general, so what's wrong with Teen Wolf the movie? Well, I would argue everything. First of all, this thing is 140 minutes long, two hours and 20 minutes, and apparently that's after they cut a ton of stuff. Supposedly they originally had a cut that was like three hours? Why? Why is it so long? The film is both overstuffed and underbaked. It has this breakneck pace, which at the very least means it doesn't drag, but this rapid pacing comes at the expense of things like characterization and emotional resonance, scenes cut away so quickly before we can get a chance to sit in an emotional moment or truly get to know our characters. The direction is quite poor. The film was directed by Russell Mulcahy, no relation, who directed many episodes of the TV show, but perhaps is no longer cut out for feature filmmaking. I'm sorry, Russell. For all I know, we might be distant cousins, but virtually every scene is bogged down by stilted performances and either boring or confusing blocking. What look? The relationship look. Oh. Yeah, that look. We know most of these people can act, so I blame the awkwardness on the direction. I have claws that drip paralytic venom in a tail that'll snap your neck. So take your hand off of me, old man. The look of the film is very cheap. It does have a slightly more cinematic look than the television show, but not by much. And whatever edge it has over the show in terms of camera quality and scope of locations is largely marred by other issues like poor lighting, dull cinematography, and bad VFX. It just looks so cheap. It looks like an asylum film or something. If you're wondering what the plot of this movie is, it is set in the year 2026 for some reason, 13 years after the in-universe conclusion of the show, I think. I can only imagine this decision was motivated by the advancing ages of the cast, like maybe they thought we wouldn't buy some of these characters being in their mid-twenties, but this results in some bizarre details. Most conspicuously, Derek has been given a teenage son, Eli Hale. Why do I have a feeling that that's about me? Or maybe my son? Like many things in this movie, they just don't explain how this came to be. Derek is a single father, there's no mom in the picture. Eli is 15 years old, so timeline-wise, he would have had to have Eli before the show ended. Or I guess Derek could have adopted him when he was a couple years old, but we don't know. We just have no idea what the story there is. Many fans have pointed out that Eli kind of seems like a Styles stand-in. He's kind of styled like Styles he acts a little like him, and strangely, he's obsessed with Styles' Jeep. Derek is a mechanic in this movie, he runs an auto shop, which in itself doesn't make any sense to me because Derek is canonically vastly independently wealthy. The Hales have multiple family vaults, including $117 million in bearer bonds. It's revealed in season four that Derek owns his entire apartment building? I own the building. And I have my own bank accounts. That doesn't necessarily mean that Derek could never have any desire to start working. Like, we all need ways to pass the time, but I feel like if he were to get a job, because he's already rich, it would probably be something more passion and hobby based. Like organic farming or making artisan pottery or something. That's what he'd be doing in my Teen Wolf sequel movie. Anyway, he's a mechanic and he has fixed up Styles' Jeep for some reason, but also never drives it and appears to dislike anyone driving it. Why the hell does he keep taking the Jeep? Because he knows I hate it. Sheriff Stalinsky later says this. Your dad had complicated feelings about that Jeep. We don't have time to unpack that here. Stay tuned for my next video. But Eli frequently steals it to Joyride, and the sheriff gifts him the Jeep in the end. So with all that, it does kind of feel like perhaps Eli is there partly to fill the Styles void. The Styles void, not to be confused with Void Styles. But I don't think that's the only reason Eli is here. My theory is that they started working on the script for this movie and then realized that the franchise is not called Adult Wolf or Working Man Wolf, it's called Teen Wolf. I think they realized that they no longer had any Teen Wolfs in their Teen Wolf, so they had to manufacture a new Teen Wolf. 
I actually don't hate the idea of Derek being a single father. His whole thing is that he lost his family before the events of the series, so starting a family makes sense as a full circle moment. I think there's something kind of sweet about that. Honestly, especially if it's some weird mystery child. Like maybe he just found a baby in the woods one day and decided to raise it. That does feel like something Derek would do. But the way they executed it, I think Eli is too old and Derek is too young. Maybe if they had cast like a real 15 year old it could have worked, or made Eli a younger kid character, but as it is, you see this 35 year old looking man with this 20 year old looking son, and they just don't read visually or chemistry wise as father and son. It's not convincing. So I feel like what they were trying to go for with this doesn't quite work, and it's largely because of that disconnect. Anyway, the Nagitsune is back. This is introduced in Japan, where Liam apparently now lives with his new girlfriend, this new Kitsune we've never met. Again, they don't really introduce her. She's kind of just there as if we know her already. It's like the whole movie thinks that because it's a continuation of a show you've already watched that they don't have to establish anything or set things up the way you normally would in a movie. This doesn't feel like a movie, and that's one of the reasons why. You might be like, a kitsune? Where's Kira? Well, apparently they tried to get Arden Cho, but she says she was offered such a disparate salary from everyone else that she declined. Deadline alleges that she was offered half the salary the other three female series regulars were offered, so she chose not to return. What is wrong with you, Jeff? Why does Teen Wolf hate Arden Cho? So the Nagitsune's back. Somehow the Nagitsune returned. This time it was brought back by Mr. Harris, the Beacon Hills chemistry teacher, who had seemingly died via druid sacrifice in season 3A, but apparently survived and wants revenge or whatever. I was your chemistry teacher, Jackson. You fucking imbecile. So the Nagitsune is the big bad of the movie, but concurrently to this, Scott, Chris Argent, and Lydia have all started seeing signs that Allison might not be fully dead and is trying to communicate with them. So they do some ritual to bring Allison back to life, and it works. It just works. I guess that emotional, consequential event that altered the course of the series was actually fully reversible. Go Teen Wolf! But Allison's memory isn't fully intact, and she's being manipulated by the Nagitsune, so all she remembers is that she hunts werewolves, and she spends the first half of the movie trying to kill Scott. Okay, you killed me. Now can we talk? But he manages to get through to her, and it's fine. Mason is also here. They made Mason a cop, which I find personally offensive. Mason was so smart. That was his whole thing. He was smart and he was going off to a good college and you're telling me he ended up just staying in his hometown and becoming a cop? He's also one of the show's only major surviving black characters and now he's just a cop, so that's awesome. Not my Mason. This is not canon to me. This show is so obsessed with cops. It got really bad around seasons four and five. I can tolerate a small town supernatural show having a sheriff character, that's just par for the course, but as the show goes on, there's eventually a lot of cop stuff. All this stuff about the sheriff and his deputies and how they're just doing their jobs, trying to keep the peace, and sometimes that means having to bend the rules a little bit. There's this part in season five where after Styles' dad finds out that Styles like accidentally murdered someone, Styles' dad is like, why wouldn't you tell me? I would have covered up all of the evidence for you to keep you safe. And you're like, you would have what? And I would destroy every shred of evidence to protect you if I had to. I would burn the whole sheriff's station to the ground. Styles' dad is a cop. Scott's dad is a cop. Styles becomes a cop. Mason becomes a cop. I hate it here. Mason also has almost nothing to do in the movie, and I'm pretty sure he and Liam don't even interact. There's no reunion moment for them or anything. What do you hear? It's like the game's happening right next to us. Then, at the end of the movie, Derek dies. The plan is that Parrish is going to burn up the Nagitsune with his overpowered hellhound fire powers, and for some reason, he can't just do that. Someone has to be holding the Nagitsune in place for it to happen. Can't Parrish hold the Nagitsune in place? 
like he's already doing, they do not do a good job of demonstrating why someone had to do that. And Derek, of all people, decides to sacrifice himself. I think this sucks so hard. Why would you give Derek a son and then have him sacrifice himself? Doesn't he have more to live for now that he has a child? As a Derek lover, I have to say, this character, who is largely defined by his traumatic backstory, including his entire family dying horrifically in a fire, concluding his story by also dying horrifically in a fire, feels a little cruel. You know, what does that say? And again, the stakes are not properly established, so it just feels really stupid and short-sighted that he would do this. And then, surely, with the scent of Derek's burning flesh still permeating the air, Scott and Allison decide it's time to kiss, and everyone's just kind of cool with what just happened. They show Derek's funeral. Coach is there for some reason, even though they established in this movie that Coach had never met Derek before the events of the film. I don't know who you are. Sheriff Stalinsky gives the jeep to Eli, who rides off into the sunset while making a series of indecipherable facial expressions. It's implied that Scott and Allison are going to adopt Eli. You got adoptions on Saturday. Eventually him. Mr. Harris is dragged away to Eichenhaus. Why don't we stop? Hey, I thought, I thought I was gonna go see my lawyer. Not to dwell too much on the cop thing, but regardless of how evil Mr. Harris is, I still think he has the right to a trial and should not be institutionalized in the spooky supernatural mental hospital against his will without even getting to speak to a lawyer. The law enforcement in Beacon Hills is incredibly corrupt. Then the movie ends on Eli, which makes me think that maybe, pathetically, they thought that they'd be able to make some kind of further continuation to Teen Wolf focused on him. If they thought that, they were sorely mistaken. Again, fan response to this film was overwhelmingly negative. As I've already said, this is just a terrible movie on a technical level. The editing is really silly. There are several moments that are just like clip shows of classic Teen Wolf moments, which feels very cheap and manipulative. There are a couple of scenes that use jump cuts in a pretty random, unmotivated way. The writing is very bad. As I've said, it doesn't feel like a movie. It doesn't bother to establish many of its characters and concepts. It sets things up without resolution, as if it's expecting to get another season of television to expand on them. It's so stuffed full of characters and threads from the original show that it doesn't feel much like a standalone story. I'm not trying to be rude, but Jeff Davis had never written a film before this, and therefore I wonder if it was wise to make him the sole screenwriter of this feature film. Maybe he could have collaborated with a writer more experienced in this type of structure. But even if you argue that it's like several episodes of TV strung together, I wouldn't say it succeeds like that either. If they split this up into TV episodes, I think they would still be bad TV episodes. One weird detail is that this movie contains profanity and nudity, both things that were not permitted in the TV show. I assume producing the film direct to streaming instead of broadcasting it on MTV meant that they had more freedom when it came to stuff like this. As a result, they keep shoehorning it in, presumably in an attempt to distinguish this as a more mature installment in the franchise, but it just comes off as cheap and vulgar, like a child first learning how to swear. Darkness, you motherfucker! Malia is as gratuitously sexualized as ever, complete with this scene where she's totally naked. She's also dating Parrish now, another cop. Ultimately, I do not consider any of this film canon. I'm glad that these actors got a paycheck, I guess, especially the Tylers get that producing credit, but like at what cost? There's so much cloying nostalgia bait in this movie. It's like when those nostalgic remakes and legacy sequels come out and like Chewbacca shows up or whatever, and the music swells, and they're clearly expecting the audience to clap or cry or something. There are several of those moments in Teen Wolf the movie when classic characters are reintroduced. Yeah. 
I don't like to use the word cringe lightly, but that's what it is. This whole movie makes me cringe. You were right. It's funny, the central premise of Allison being resurrected feels like this giant, perfect metaphor for what this movie represents. Allison died back in 2013 because the actress, an adult woman, was ready to move on. And that was actually one of the more mature moments the show ever had. It finally demonstrated a willingness to submit to finality, to the idea that not everything lasts forever and not everyone on this show is impervious to harm. It raised the stakes and forced Scott's character to come of age that much more. What the 2023 film demonstrates is an unwillingness to submit to finality, an unwillingness to let go, to move on, to accept the permanent of death and the conclusion of a television show. By bringing back Allison, by throwing 31-year-old Scott McCall back into a high school lacrosse game, yes, that's a real thing that happens in this movie, the film and its creators prove that they are in a state of perpetual adolescence, unable to grow up, just replaying old clips over and over again in the hopes of reviving some bygone emotional response to the glory days. In other words, Teen Wolf peaked in high school. And like the Nagitsune, we can only hope that this time it stays dead. If you liked this, you should subscribe. And if you want bonus content and or think I should be entitled to compensation for making another feature length video about Teen Wolf, you should check out my Patreon. Link in description. Okay, good night.